a minor delay. We locked ourselves out of the office. I had to run down to get another team member's key, and I thought it was at one, and then our mic didn't work. But uh, thank you so much for um, joining us today. So uh, we're going to kick off. Uh, my name is Don Bowman. This is my colleague, Nicholas St. Pierre, and together we are Team Agilicus. Agilicus today, we'd like to talk about really seamless vendor access without sacrificing security or simplicity, particularly around a manufacturing style environment. And uh, So today we're going to talk about that friction between the industrial network and IT, and that friction comes because things are fundamentally different. Yeah. You know, you can't have downtime, you don't have Patch Tuesday, and there's usually fairly weak internal security, usually fairly flat networks. But then there's this, this, this thing that's been happening. People want faster time to repair. Vendors want, they don't want to roll a truck to you. It costs you money, it costs them money. They have staffing issues. And there's this issue with shared accounts. And you know, it's easy to say I created the vendor X account, everybody shares it, but people leave companies, as you know. And then there's new requirements coming, whether it be driven internally by controls or insurance and things like multi-factor become very challenging with that. And then the other problem is, it's their problem, my partner's problem. They have IP addresses on their machines, they overlap with yours. When they connect the VPN, it breaks, they have to re-jig it, they're not happy. You dictate certain software, they, they can't install it. Um, and nobody's really as happy as, as they could be. So what's that overall challenge look like? So prognostication, over the last set of years, people see the industrial environment has becoming more like the IT environment, just slowly. But things have a long life cycle. You know, you buy a laptop, it's going to be with you for three years, it's gone. You buy a water treatment plant and you fill it full of PLCs, that's a 25-year capital investment. And there's no, you know, sometimes it's even difficult to get the programming software to still run. You know, you need a machine running Commodore PET. <laughs> um, <laughs> Probably not a true story, but maybe. Um, but increasingly, these things are merging. You're starting to see, well, in order to get my compliance, I've got this big data, I've got cloud, I've got you know, yep. this sort of requirement, and how do I get this ancient thing safely into the modern internet without having my plant caught on fire and me on the six o'clock news? And that's a lot of the challenges you, you highlighted in, in the frictions, right? The, the systems that don't have VPN, that don't have multi-tenant, that don't have user credentials, date back to that era of 15, 20 years ago yeah. where it, you know, the concern was let's be online, not about the security aspect of the solution. Yeah, exactly. Like, you, you know, back in those days, the post-it note was secure because you had to be physically there. And suddenly the post-it note may not be, you know, the paradigm of security that people are looking for. And nobody wants their plant out of service. You don't want to be the person that says, we're just going to turn production off for a couple of days while we you know, upgrade. Um, but often this new equipment, some of it is so complicated, it can only be supported by the OEM or the integrator, or in some cases they dictate that. Mm -hmm. I call that the John Deere business model. It's, you want to buy this from me, you're going to get the support from me. But there's no security. So that's the challenge. Oops. And so... If I put myself in the shoes of the people that I talk to daily and say, what's my challenge? They say, production must produce, don't get in our way. Security is important, production is the most important. So certainly we're not gonna have planned downtime, we're not gonna have unplanned downtime either. So you, know, you work around that. And by the way, patches and updates, they break things, so by the way, you work around that. And then they say, my team, my partners, they need remote access. I need to improve my mean time to repair. Um, but how do I do that? My partners are varied. Some are individuals, some are large companies. I can't really dictate their policies. My controls network, it's really unsegmented. It's kind of all or nothing. You're in, you're in, you're out, you're out. It uses broadcast domain on, on one VLAN. And by the way, the budget's zero until something bad happens, in which case spend as fast as you can because it's going to zero again next year. And that's a huge dichotomy or almost the opposite of, of what we think about today from the IT networks. All of these points here, I plan my downtime in my yeah. IT network. I, I have a patch upgrade policy or time frame to do this. Uh, I get to choose the security policy or the IT policy for my partners coming in. But now I have the challenge of bringing all of that OT or industrial infrastructure into that model. And that definitely have some solid challenges to meet there. It'd be nice to be a dictator some days, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's a good movie too. Um, so if I put myself in the shoes of the partner, and I say, well, what would they say? Because you know, it's, it's an ecosystem. We're all in this together. 
you know, I, I'm a vendor of world-class software for security. You're a manufacturer of world-class products. Your vendors are also manufacturers of world-class products and support them. We all need to win in order to win. But they would say, look, I support hundreds of customers. It, it really isn't feasible if they each have a different VPN technology. I, I just can't install that all on my technicians' laptops. They each want a different multi-factor technique. Like it's just, I, you know, I'm going to have a wall full of Yubi keys. And but, but that does exist today. Some people get very, very complex, yeah. huge amount of toil, huge amount of processes to just to get that done with even just a few vendors. Or... I, I kind of imagine it's like looking at a valet parking in Vegas where there's like <laughs> keys all over the wall, right? <laughs> um, and then I think of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and I think of the Ferrari, and I think maybe That's this right, is getting exactly. out of control, and, and then they drive it backwards. But um, each Everybody needs different licensed software, and how can you say to your, your vendors, you know, you need to use this VPN, and it costs this much per seat, so thanks. It comes back to you on the cost, right? Um, the vendors, the partners, their teams change. People come and go, whether they come on good terms or bad terms, you really don't want them having access later. And everybody wants efficiency. Drive time is dead time. Yep. You know, it's, yep. you know, rolling a truck is, is, is dead in all regards. Um, I'm sympathetic to your security needs, but those are ultimately your problem. I run my business, you run yours. Uh, we, we, we can't really meet in the middle here. So there's a non-answer out there. And the non-answer is kind of let Easy entropy, yeah, let entropy <laughs> take its case. You know, you know the, 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 closing the barn door after the horse has left, the horse hasn't left yet, why should I close the barn door? So I'm just going to create a shared account for partner company, you know, the Siemens account. I know there's a couple hundred thousand people work there, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to create a jump box, remote desktop, and maybe it's got complete internal access when it's on, it's on off. And a VPN of the jump box, and I got a file that kicks around somewhere called passwords.xls. We don't talk about this, it's kind of like Fight Club. It's, it's not there, but I it's look there. It up. It's under my desk. Yeah, right? it's under there. It's, 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 a, it's, it's sort of like LastPass, except it's the second LastPass. And uh, we're just going to turn a blind eye to the HR changes at our partners, you know, see what happens. This is what we call a total trust model. And this really, really is efficient when it works. Unfortunately, it's pervasive as well. It's also pervasive. And you know, you think about people you work with for a long time, you're gonna trust them, they're not untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the default password for the lab access three or four companies ago. I oh. still have it drilled into my head. When I worked at Hewlett Packard, the root password was I forget on everything. <laughs> and we all knew that. I don't know if it's true anymore. If you still work at HP, just put a little comment down below if it's true. Um, I never forgot it. Um, the outcome of that total trust model is the day it fails, it fails in a very big way. Yeah. So while it's working, it's super efficient, everybody gets their job done. The day it fails, there's acrimony and bitter smoke and- mm. The picture is very- The point. picture, right? You know, it's blowing up. The blast radius is, is never mitigated in That's those right. circumstances. And you never really know. So person A, partner A is person B leaving bad terms, but they have your mm. credentials. You figured that out a few days later, Partner B, they click on a tempting email link and boom, they're in your network because the VPN's open and that's the highway to hell. Uh, partner C has an always on VPN remote desktop machine and SMS reflector because they need to share the multi-factor and they figured out a way around it. And as a consequence, the best case scenario is you're just failing your audit when someone finds. Not a big fan of SMS. So. I am not a fan of SMS reflectors. I, I would say SMS is not a secure mechanism for anything. Right. Yep. I wouldn't use it for anything that you because it's, it's widely cracked. So uh, just to underscore this fact, you know, a lot of people think about you know, manufacturing, industrial control, et cetera. This isn't where the real money is because it's not the ERP system, it's not the financial system. But you know, cyber criminals have found this is a lucrative niche. And in fact, manufacturing industry is the top ranked at attack vector. And you know, ransomware is the, is the thing of today because it's an easy way to get money out of places, but it could be other types of ransom they could hold you for. It's like, well, you know, 10 of the last 20 things you shipped have a huge safety issue in them because you know, I turned off the inspection machine. Do you want those customers to find out the hardware or the easy way, pay me? You know, yeah. it's something like that. And industrial control systems is a huge target of opportunity. We, we look at, you know, if, if you're going to go after the security posture of an IT system versus an OT system that has 15-year-old components in it. It's going to be very easy to go into. Plus, we talked about in production, cannot have downtime, not even planned downtime. Therefore, the urge to fix any sort of, of cyber locking or ransomware is going to be 
very high pressure on the owners of that system to solve it and, and give in to the yeah. demands. Right? Everybody's going to pay, and because they paid once, yeah. they're, they're going to keep coming back, and they're going to keep paying, and eventually the cost of the product goes up, and everybody loses and uh, becomes a problem. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Nick, and Nick's yes. going to talk about, hey, there's a better way. It turns out that there's a better way to do this. So let's look about that better way, zero trust and federating access. So let's imagine that we're no longer bound to a username and password to that spreadsheet, you know, username and password per vendor. We're still going to rely on who you are. Let's talk about identity. Let's move away from credentials that are simple, you know, I forget with my username root. I'm going to keep accessing the resources, whether they're on my premise or a partner premise or a vendor premise, uh, using the existing credentials that I have. And those could be credential-wise, my Office 365 identity. It could be things that I have, things that I know, multi-factor. It could be my Android device. It could be a non-shared multi-factor, not an SMS reflector. It could be my one-time password. It could be my thumbprint. It could be biometric. And it doesn't matter where I'm employed, who, my, who the vendor or the contractor is. This follows me, both from a workflow of employment perspective. If I leave my employer access of my employer credentials or identity are revoked, but if I go somewhere else, they keep uh, being reinstated as another employer. But it could be also like very small, you know, self-employed contractor. I may have my Gmail account. I may have my Outlook.com account. And I have the factors or the multiple factors that are associated with that. Once I have that identity, I'm going to pair it with other things, resources. We talked a lot about network and the big nuclear blast of, of, of the impact that, had, that that has when it's compromised. I'm going to be given access on a per resource basis, not on a per network basis. I will no longer think about resources as IP addresses, or IP network that can traverse east, west, laterally, uh, and go and, and willy-nilly into an organization. I'm going to know what resource I have access to, uh, who has access to these resources. Is it unconditional? Is it time-bound? And I'm going to be able to audit this. So we talked about AAA and access authorization and accounting, or in this case, audit. I'm going to know at any given time a non-repudiated record of who accessed what resource, even if they had a shared credentials, for example, uh, from a vendor uh, perspective. So do you think less accounts is going to be more secure? People have less passwords. Remember, it's harder to spearfish them. Exactly. Traditionally, we, we sort of are coming into the age of understanding that having a million passwords is, is not necessarily the best practice. Understanding that our identity is our access leads us to secure it a lot better. Having factors that are ours uh, allows us to secure them a lot better. So we're a lot more diligent about our own access than we are about a multitude of passwords that are created by another entity. Uh, and, and the same is true for the network as an IT administrator, not having a perimeter now, having uh, no trust in any device relationship. So no open ports inbound on my firewall no VPN access, having a DMZ that's extremely secure from a port scanning or, 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 or a vector uh, for attacks. So when we talk about zero trust and Don and I, the way to understand it easily is that any pairing of access or resource to user must contain three things. The first one we just talked about is who you are, as your identity, uh, how you're authenticated, what devices you're authenticating with, what uh, factor you might be adding to your authentication, the second one is one that we deal with a lot today is what device or what resource are you going to be accessing? So we have, I know you are, I know the device that you need to access, but also what permission level you need access to. And that becomes very important in industrial control systems because like you mentioned, Don, a lot of them are 10, 15 years old, don't have a concept of user roles and permission. So having the ability as we expose these resources to fine grain the access into these components that were not built from the ground up with those facilities help us really secure these specific resources. Last one is how. How am I going to access these resources securely? So we've now have a full zero trust model where all three of these components must be matched together in order for someone to access a resource at a certain level. So you're saying that all this fuss about zero trust, it comes down to who, what, and how. If I know who you are, and I decide what you're allowed to do, and I figure out how to get you to that thing, I got zero trust? That's basically it. There's no implicit trust between any of these three components until they are explicitly matched together. Hmm. Uh, and once we have that, then we have a secure network. You think of any other role like a VPN or a port forwarding, 
uh, or an application that has a simple static username and password into it, you only are dealing with individual silos of these three items. And once we combine them into the zero trust model, then we have a secure platform. So we want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, so it turns out that zero trust, so success has many parents. And I once on stage doing a webinar with a bunch of people that were not really competing with me, and somebody said something ridiculous. They, he, I think he said he invented big data. And I said, hey, I'm Don, I invented the battery. And people looked at me funny. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, he could make up stuff. But, uh, you know, we kind of made this up a little bit. You know, we've, we've been doing this since, since it began. Zero Trust really got everybody's wind behind the sail in 2019 when the National Institute of uh, Standards Technology just put all their effort into it. And then each of the uh, last two US um, pres presidents have, have signed executive orders and it's just everywhere now. And you see it in all industries. And it really comes down to there's all kinds of standards and they got all kinds of texts. And if you have who, what, and how, you have a zero trust architecture. And if you just keep that in mind and you think about, I'm not getting a user into the network, I'm getting a user to that thing with the role they're allowed. Oh, they're allowed to view the HMI but not modify it. You know, this user is allowed to check the toner in the printer, but not set it on fire. You know, they can't turn the UPS off. Yep. You know, if you have that set, then you really have the, the essence of these NIST standards. There's a lot more in the standards, of course. Yeah. But well, you make a point that the last two administrations, I've made an explicit yeah. statement regarding zero trust. And now individual agencies are coming out with explicit references. Yeah, to these yeah it's areas. everywhere. Public sector, private sector, you name it. All right, so why? I think we, we saw the picture of the legacy system with the big mushroom cloud. Now we understand what are the consequences, what are the advantages of implementing a zero trust network architecture. First of all, I mentioned it a little bit in passing east-west. Right? We're, we're, we're forgetting, we're leaving the network layer behind. We're talking about resources. So if I do have a compromised account identity, for example, and someone's able to get into a resource at a certain level of permission, lease permission, then if that gets compromised, I have a very small and very finite blast radius so that I can go into my audit and then find out where it stopped. If you, you know, by, by, in contrast, if the uh, compromised resource is your VPN and your network, your audit is probably going to take longer than the lockdown subsequent to uh, the compromise. What it also does is it allows you to onboard very easily new devices, new clients, new vendors, external users, entire organizations can come in because you're no longer bound to having individual account names, individual device provisioning. All of it now has no implicit trust, like we mentioned, who, what, and how. And therefore, I can bring these applications, whether legacy or new, into this model and implement what's called defense in depth. I now have no perimeters on my network. I need to define a trust relationship in between these three criteria that I uh, explained earlier. And now I'm able to actually uh, layer that functionality on top of my legacy applications. As a good example here, for example, I, want, I have an HMI that has no concept of username and password. It's, it's a web app with a display, and I have my pump controllers on it. I want to be able to give access to anyone to that interface using their existing OpenID Connect and single sign-on and multi-factor authentication, for example. So overall, we want to simplify the control because that leads to adoption of the solution. And we want to be able to audit end-to-end -end from provisioning to access to authorization and logout. One of the things I'm particularly proud of, so you take something that has been bolted to your wall for a long time, a Rockwell HMI, it's sort of got Windows CE 6.5 inside it, and it runs uh, uh, VNC. And with our system, you can say single sign-on, multi-factor, read-only access to somebody who doesn't work for me, who has no other access to my network. And you can say, well, that's a safe enough thing. We're debugging this thing together, and they're in a different time zone. And that you can't really do that any other way. You know, that, that, you, there's no change to that equipment that's there. But suddenly, in a browser, they did a modern single sign-on, and boom, appears the HMI right there to click. And it's, it's read-only or read-write, whatever you've chosen. I, I'm pretty proud of that feature for us. And one thing you mentioned. It's a browser single sign. There's no requirement for that new user. They could be in a truck on the side of the road with a tablet. Correct. Yeah. There's no new yeah. learning curve for them to access. This. 2023, people know how to use a browser. Exactly. <laughs> so what we come down with 
is reimagining the air gap. The reality is new industrial control system or even distributed control systems uh, are starting to leverage cloud. What that means is our air gap network, where we've had devices, where we've had no downtime, no patching, uh, you know, very limited access now tends to actually want to spread their wing and get out to either big data or getting remote vendor access. What we end up is not providing network access between two endpoints, a vendor and my local secure network. I go back to the model. I have an identity, I have the resource, and I have the means of interconnecting them with a level of permission that may not have been existent uh, prior to that. So now we have what was called air gap with zero trust. I still have my devices in these examples here. I may have a dashboard or an HMI that they in their own right have no internet access or still secured in my facility, but through a zero trust network architecture topology, Agilicus, for example, I'm able to access them. I'm able to deal with them as if I were local to that secure network and limit the blast radius. Yeah, so in this case, no inbound access through your firewall, no opening a port, no VPN there, no shared passwords, but you can pinpoint, you can get access to that one thing that one user needs, either on demand, on request, on this and that with a full audit. And you know, going back to that earlier, it's, it's, it's not zero sum, everybody wins. Yep. It's more efficient for your partner, it's more efficient for you, it costs them less money, you make more money, and it's more secure at the same time. Yeah, and, and don't, let's not forget uh, like GRC governance, risk management, and compliance. Here I may have uh, an open account to an HMI with VNC you were mentioning, but I have a non-repudiated uh, audit that employee at domain1.com using their Outlook or Office 365 or Azure AD credentials logged into this HMI. At any given time, I have full control and audit uh, from a compliance perspective as who's accessing what. If I have a lost share credential, for example, I can verify very quickly if there was an attempt uh, to gain access to those resources. So trust but verify. Exactly. Uh, great Reaganism. <clears throat> so what we end up with here, like I mentioned, we're moving away from the network layer. We're going to identity, employee at domain1.com. I have that identity recorded from an audit perspective, but also from a session perspective. I have a resource, in this case an HMI, that may not have a concept of user may not have a concept or even a session, it's just always on, the Windows laptop is always turned on in a water treatment facility. What, then I, why, what I then create here is a pairing, a network access without any firewall changes that you mentioned. I don't need to create inbound access into this HMI, my firewall level for each individual vendor because I'm going through our cloud platform. I'm not imposing a device requirement. I'm not imposing VPN credentials requirement. And I can offer single sign-on. I can also offer multi-factor authentication if that employee's credentials, for example, either don't satisfy my basic domain requirements or even the security requirements if I'm unable to verify that that uh, uh, contractor, for example, uh, is implementing MFA properly, like we mentioned SMS. I may want to do one-time password or even biometrics on top of it. Cool. So, Don, why does this reduce vendor risk? Well... If I play back what I heard Nick say, I heard Nick say, look, your vendors are going to have, your partners are going to have the HR practice they have. People are going to come and go, and you're not going to find out instantaneously, but they're going to instantaneously take them out of their own Office 365 or Google Workplace system. Mm -hmm. Therefore, their HR churn isn't my risk. Right. So I think that's reduced the risk. And I think... How often have people on this webinar received a call from a partner saying, hey, this employee has just left, please suspend their VPN credentials? Probably not as many who haven't received the call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second is that overbroad access. So, you know, what was my alternative? My alternative was I have an IP in the remote network. Basically, a VPN is a long Ethernet cable, mm -hmm. and it goes to a jump box. The jump box goes anywhere, and you're just supposed to stay in the area you can. But then you're importing the risk of their network and their machine. What if they've got... You know, what if they've accidentally clicked on something bad? That blast radius is now a single system. Defense in depth, it'd be nice to say I never had a problem, but it's almost as nice to say the problem stayed there, and I know exactly. that because. And I guess the third one, the audit trail, I get that trust but verify the, the Reaganism, other than also declaring ketchup to be a vegetable um, and firing air traffic controllers. You know, trust but verify is really powerful. People tend to do the right thing when they know the audit is there. And as long as your audits and controls and compliance are easy to get done and not, you know, a pain in the ass, you know, everybody is going gonna, is gonna to stay on, on game there. But also just reducing that cost of doing the audits means you may do them more frequently, 
which might in turn reduce your risk. Um, and I guess removing the VPN means the, the only the resource and its network are accessible. So th that can have other side effects, you know, privacy or not, you know, they're doing a, a capture and then, oh my God, you know, what are they going to capture by doing that? You know, oh, they're trying a new version of software. I wonder if that's going to leak sideways, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, and I guess the last one for, for the risk is, this may be a financial risk. You know, the, the, if you don't have shared software, then you don't have to worry about my licenses on your machine. Yeah. Then you don't have to worry about my vendors coming to me to check my compliance and maybe I've shared a license that I shouldn't have. It also leads to adoption, I think. It's very important if the contractor feels that there's a toil or a learning curve to get onto that platform, yeah. then it, it tends to create either a friction or an hesitation to adopt it. But if there's no additional software, no shared software, no custom credentials to learn. I think it, it naturally flows that the same system that's used locally is now used remotely, and it just naturally gets I guess, out. I guess the other risk that maybe you could highlight is your vendor has 10 people to support. They're likely going to do the best job and the ones that are the easiest to work with, yeah. and you're not going to be spending all the time yelling at them, that, why hasn't this fixed? Because you were the easiest one. You got done first. Maybe that's a different type of risk. Right, yeah. um, so I guess that was our topic today. You're welcome to type questions into the chat there, and Nick and I will uh, will answer them. But in a nutshell, our proposal is public identity systems. Every company, every person has one today, whether it's your lowly Gmail or Hotmail, or it's your Azure AD, Office 365, uh, Google Workplace, Okta. They have a natural identity. They know it. Don't retrain them on a different one. Allow them to single sign on. And then you need to also, your partners, they can own their, the who, but you must own the what. The what is what they're allowed to do, and you control either vendor A or person B, whatever the granularity you need is, they're allowed to do this thing. And then the how, the how is our secret sauce. It can work behind network address translation, LTE modems, Starlink, uh, it's outbound only, it's in WebSocket, HTTPS formats, so it can be inspected by inspecting firewalls like Palo Alto and Zscaler and so on. But that's really the proposal that Gillicus has is we think we can make vendor management simpler than some of the other alternatives, either doing nothing or sharing passwords, and make it, make it easier to use at the same time. So more secure, more simple, everybody wins. Um, and that's what we'd love to chat with you about.